Mr. Ambassador, for joining us today. Um, I think my first question to you is, uh, looking backward, um, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, of course, has referred to you as your unwavering passion for, in support of women's and girls' rights. And I wondered if I could ask you, what do you see as some of the major opportunities and challenges, of course, ahead for gender equity uh, and women around the world? We have our work con to continue to be cut out for us, uh, but I think what we know today uh, in very significant ways, if I were to say uh, what one of the major differences is between even 20 years ago and now, uh, is the mountain of data and research and studies uh, that demonstrate what an extraordinary high yield investment uh, women and girls represent uh, for a country's general prosperity, for poverty alleviation, uh, as well as uh, the kind of uh, efforts we need to uh, continue to make on economic participation because it demonstrably uh, shows that uh, we still have a ways to go no matter how important that is. What do you think is working in terms of getting girls access to quality education around the world? Well, I think we need a well-integrated approach and you're exactly right. Uh, we've made progress, but we, we do have um, important steps that we need to continue to take. Uh, one of the strong indicators uh, for progress is girls' education. Uh, we also know that girls' education is the single best economic uh, um, effective uh, investment that can be made. Uh, to that end, it is not always easy. And while we know that more and more girls are in school, we also um, regrettably know that uh, at the same time, we haven't made the kind of uh, efforts at providing uh, ed quality education because what some data is beginning to show is yes, girls are in school, but when they come out of school, they can't compute and they can't read. That has to change. So we need to really look at an integrated approach. And I think there are so many good examples of what's working and to take what's working to scale uh, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel each and every time. So you're known, of course, for your work in advancing the role of women in peace building. Uh, as executive director of Georgetown University's new Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, what do you see as the top priorities for engaging women in peace building and their role in conflict around the world? Well, you know, Drew, this is such a big area, and it's one why the United States uh, has focused so much over the last couple years um, you know, we had an intensive process that was undertaken uh, in the White House, bringing together the major agencies like the State Department, USAID, the Defense Department, and others uh, to really focus at how we needed to do a better job to ensure uh, that women were engaged at all levels of the peace process. We've got to do a better job uh, to ensure that efforts to end conflict are not just what is signed on a piece of paper, but really that those efforts address the critical needs that need to be met by a society to put the conflict behind, create uh, a better future for the people, and address those critical issues that will address that better future. Women are rarely at the peace table as negotiators, some 8% in the last two decades. That's an abysmal record. And yet women from Northern Ireland to Liberia, when they have uh, been part of the process, have made an enormous contribution. Women bring issues to the table that ordinarily don't get on the table. And those are vital issues, uh, whether they have to do with human rights or they have to do with economic considerations uh, that are critical to the future uh, sustainability of a peace. Uh, and to the creation of that better future. I, again, want to salute IREX for the work it does uh, in conflict resolution and the recognition that where women are more significantly engaged, uh, the impacts are so much greater uh, for the sustainability of peace. Um, uh, is in terms of media freedom and free expression. Uh, and I wondered if you um, had some thoughts about the presence of women in media as practitioners and of course also their voice, their voice as leaders or their voice as ordinary citizens or as experts or as intellectuals or as academics. 
Well, I think it's, it's important for a lot of reasons. First of all, to be able to demonstrate that women do have voice uh, and they do uh, belong in this space that far too long uh, in many places did not include women. Um, some governments and other actors in society don't want corruption exposed. Uh, they don't want to see issues that they are more comfortable never seeing the light of day, getting the light of day. And oftentimes it's very gutsy women who understand what these issues represent for their society, for the betterment of their people, who will go out of their way and take uh, those risks to make a difference. Uh, so I think the more women who can be engaged in media, uh, the better. You've uh, traveled ceaselessly, of course, um, in, as a champion of the role of women in the future of our world. And I wondered if there was a moment or an interaction or an image that you sort of hold that underpinned for you the, the importance of your work or that you were essentially on the right track in terms of emphasizing this uh, challenge and this potential for us. I remember sitting in Afghanistan with a group of women and this statement I will never forget uh, when one of them said to me one night, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And so I think we all need to be about raising up those leaders, giving them voice, helping them raise their voices, uh, much of what you've been doing here at IREX. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you.